Hilchis Shabbos, Perek Achad Asar, the laws of Shabbos, chapter 11. In this series of chapters that we're in right now, the Rambam is examining and defining all of the 39 Avot Melachot, 39 primary labors that are forbidden on Shabbos. During the last three chapters, we covered the first 28 out of 39, and today, in the 11th chapter, we do another 8, bringing us to a total of 36. And we begin, as it's on the screen, with the Melacha of Shechita which literally, in its literal context, refers to slaughtering an animal or a chicken, so you can get its hide, so you can write on, as we saw the other day in chapter 7, it's the process of writing on a scroll. But as we'll see, the uh, overall, the overarching element of shechita is the idea of taking a life. It says the Ramam Halacha Aleph HaShochet Chayab, one who slaughters is liable for having violated the Shabbos. For lo shochet bilvad, and it's not only the slaughterer who is liable, ela kol hanotel neshama, Anybody who takes the life of any living organ, being, a beast, an animal, a bird, a fish, or a rodent, and the act doesn't have to be through slaughtering, whether through slaughtering or nechira means tearing apart, or through hitting. You hit the rodent and it dies. Chayav, you are liable. However, if you strangulate, if you choke something living to death, harezet toledet shochet. We can't call that the primary labor of slaughtering because there's no blood. It isn't the typical way of killing. You're simply strangling. Nevertheless, it's a derivative of shochet, and you are liable biblically on the same level. Therefore, if you were to pick up a fish from a bowl of water and left it to die, you'd be held liable on account of strangulation. And by the way, when it comes to a fish, says the Rambam, the fish doesn't have to entirely die. Once the area of a sela, a sela is a, is a Talmudic coin, it's, uh, it's supposed to be from the time of the temple, somewhere around there, the post-temple period. It's not life-size, by the way, just zoomed it in to see. It's uh, somewhere about the size of a nickel, or maybe a little bigger than that. As long as the size of a sela coin dries up between the fins of the fish, Chayav, you're already liable. Once that area dries up, it can no longer survive. If one was to stick his hand into the uterus of an animal and detach the fetus that's in its stomach, Chayav, you would also be liable on account of Shochet because you are cutting it off from its source of life, taking away its Neshama. The Rebbe once wondered, how could Shechita be one of the 39 Malachot? You know, every Malacha is supposed to be a constructive labor. What's constructive about slaughtering? So some will tell you that because that's the only way to get to eating meat. But if you remember the, the principles in chapter 1, that's like a malacha she'ina tzricha legufa. That's when you're doing the labor, not for its primary intent. The primary intent is literally taking a life of a living being. So how could that be looked at as something constructive? And the Rebbe once said, based on the Talmud, that says, in v'shachat ela umashach. The word shachat, shechita, also connotes ha'ala'a lifting upwards. When a Jew slaughters an animal with the proper purpose of using it for the right things, it's a constructive thing. It brings the animal up into the next kingdom. It elevates the animal. And therefore, in this way, it becomes a malacha shel tikkun, a, a labor that provides constructive results. Halacha bet, and here we come to a very fascinating topic that I'm going to take a couple of moments to get into. Rimasim shehen parin veravin mizacharu nekeva. Insects that are reproduced from male and female uniting. O nehevin min ha'afar. Or those insects that come into being through what's called spontaneous generation. They don't require a male and female to, to uh, produce them. They simply come out of the earth. Kemoha paroshin, like certain fleas. Ha-horegotan, according to Jewish law, one who kills these things, chayav kehoreg behema v'chaya. You're liable, just like a person who kills an animal or a living being. Aval remasim. But insects that come into being spontaneously, not from the dust, but rather from manure or from fruit that rotted, like worms that can be found in meat and worms that can be found in legumes, one who kills them, patur, is considered to be exempt because they don't have the same status as a regular living organism. Now, from the very fact that halacha differentiates between different types of spontaneously generated insects, that it presumes that it's axiomatic, that Jewish law believes in the principle of spontaneous generation. Now, there was some major experiments conducted in France in the last century, which seemingly proved, or so some thought, that spontaneous generation is a no-go. It's an impossible, every single thing, at least on a microscopic level, 
is produced from a union of male and female. And in 1964, somebody once wrote about this to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe wrote a very compelling letter about the issue. And I think even though it's not directly related to the chapter, it's important that we are aware of the position of the Torah in these areas. So I'm going to post it on the screen right over here. This is from a letter of the 9th of ER, 5724, summer of 1964. And I'm just taking out some quotes so that we can appreciate the Rebbe's position here. And the Rebbe apparently had a conversation with a certain fellow in Yechidut in a private audience. And this is a follow-up to the man who had written a letter to the Rebbe. The Rebbe was responding. And he says, during our conversation, I told you that I had studied this matter from the scientific point of view when I was in France. And having acquainted myself with the authoritative scientific books and authors dealing with this question. The only thing that I was able to ascertain scientifically, listen to this, says the Rebbe, even scientifically, is that science does not deny the possibility of spontaneous generation, but only declares that so far, observation has only shown that certain instances of what was believed in the past to be spontaneous generation were in fact not spontaneous. So when people used to point to certain examples and say, aha, that's an illustration of spontaneous generation, those were disproven. But science never categorically disproved the concept of spontaneous generation in its entirety. Says the Rebbe a little bit later in the next paragraph. This person writes that maybe there's a uh, a contradiction between Torah and science on the matter. Says the Rebbe, there can only be a contradiction between Torah and science if science has an absolute position. Surely it should be axiomatic that so long as science does not come out with a categorical declaration that spontaneous generation is impossible, there is no need to attempt to reinterpret the saying of our sages. And the Rebbe says, I repeat, I carefully studied this matter in France where most of the scientific research in this area was done, and I have not found any scientific conclusion that certain low forms of living matter cannot come into being from non-living material. As a matter of fact, many modern biologists believe, says the Rebbe, that it is possible that certain low forms may have developed through chemical processes from non-living matter, even if this cannot be demonstrated under satisfac satisfactorily controlled conditions. You see, every time we do experiments in a lab, there's a controlled element to it. And so many times certain experiments don't work because of the controlled environment. Says that even if we couldn't prove it in controlled conditions, it doesn't take away from the fact that many biologists believe, and it's certainly entirely possible, that spontaneous generation could still be a matter of fact. And then the Rebbe says, however, later on, in regards to the question of spontaneous generation, there is no room whatsoever to explain away the position of our sages in this matter inasmuch as it comes in the area of practical halacha and in plain categorical terms. One of the examples is in our chapter. The, the Torah clearly differentiates between spontaneous and non-spontaneously born bugs. In other words, it is not a case of conjecture, as you write, this person writing to the Rebbe, about the explanation which you heard. Namely, if there were spontaneous generation, then the halacha would be such and such. The halacha states explicitly that there are species which come into being from non-living matter, and therefore the din is such and such. The premise of the laws that we're learning right now in the Chod Shabbat is that there is such a thing as spontaneous generation. So we can never just do away with the sages having said, you know, they didn't mean it or they don't know whether there's such, such generation or not. Since halacha deals with it, it's effectively clear that halacha believes in it. Science has no absolute theory on the matter and therefore the Rebbe concludes that it is the Torah's position and science has not disproven it that spontaneous generation is indeed a matter of fact. I thought I would mention that's very important to know as a fundamental of the Jewish faith in which we don't believe in contradictions between Torah and science. Torah speaks in terms of absolute truths. Science is only theoretical. And whenever we see something with the sages colliding with something in science, it's not Torah that has to be reinterpreted, but science that has to be re-examined, as the Rebbe taught us time and again. Let's continue on Halacha Gimel. Hamaflek Hilav B'Shabbat, one who delouses his clothing on Shabbos. Here we have clothes. In times of old, it was very common to find lice. And before you wore clothing, certainly out of hygienics, you'd want to check it to see if there's no lice. Molele takinim vizorkan. You can simply rub off the lice and throw them away. Umutar laharoga takinim b'shabbat. And you can even kill the lice on Shabbos, because they are produced from sweat. They don't grow out of male and female unions. If you have beasts or, rod or insects, that if they bite, they will certainly kill you. And the Ramam gives a couple of examples, but they're not, limit, they're not limiting. Any one of the examples in our times would also qualify. The very dangerous fly in Egypt, and the hornet in the area of Ninveh. That's the top two over there. I just took one for illustration purposes, just a fly and a hornet. And the scorpion in the area of Chadiav, and the poisonous snake in Israel, the Kelev Shotet Bechomakom, and a rabid dog, a wild dog, anywhere that it may be. Since they will certainly kill with their bite, you can kill them on Shabbos as soon as they become visible to you. Any other damaging animal or living being, 
They won't kill you, but they'll damage you. If they were chasing you, you can kill them. But if they were just sitting in their place or running away from you, then it's forbidden to kill them and, uh, because they don't pose any immediate threat to you. If you step on them casually as you're walking and kill them as though you were innocent, lefitumo means as though you're innocent, mutar then it's permitted. Now the thing with mutar is that it means initially permitted. Here the Ramam is describing a case of after the fact. If you stepped on them, it's, you can't say if you stepped on them, it's permitted. So the commentary has explained that what we mean is it's initially permitted to make as though you're simply walking regularly and to, tra- and to trample these types of things so that they don't endanger you further. Halakha hey. We now move on to the next malacha of hafshata, skinning. After one slaughters an animal, typically it would be skinned for the hides. Hamafshit mina or kirela asot kamea. If you skin the hide of an animal, enough, you take off enough skin to make an amulet. It was customary in those times when people would carry around amulets, different you know, pieces of parchment with Hashem's names, different angels' names on it. So as long as it's big enough to make this amulet, chayav, you're liable on account of skinning. The next malacha is ha'abada, tanning process. If you tan hides enough, enough of the hide to make an amulet, you are chayav, you're liable. The truth is that it applies whether to one who salts or to one who tans. There was two ways to work hides. One of them was to be salted. It's literally someone poured salt all over this hide. And the other one is to put it through a process through different liquids and soaking and different types of things. Both are considered to be the melacha of ha'abada. However, the idea of a tanning process cannot be applied to foodstuffs. So there's no derivatives of ibud that apply in food areas. The next malacha is mechikat ha'or, shaving down the hair from the hide of an animal to make it smooth. One who smooths down from the hide enough skin to make an amulet, chayav, he is liable. Ve'ezahu mochek, what qualifies as mochek? Typically mochek means erasing. What are you erasing when it comes to hides? Says the Rambam, the erasure is, zehama avir se'ar, o hatzemer me'al ha'or, that's one who takes, takes off the hair or the wool from the hide, achar mita, after death, ad she'yachalik pane ha'or, till the face of the skin is smooth. Now, the Rambam adds the words after death, because seemingly if you were to shave the hair, or to shave the wool while it was alive, that would put you not in the category of mochek, but rather in the category of gozez. The problem is that when it comes to gozez, the other day we learned that one is obligated for shearing wool even after death. So what is the difference between gozez and mochek? So the commentaries say it depends on your intent. When you're shearing wool, in the case of gozez, there you want the wool. So if you want the wool, even if it's, even if it's after the animal is dead, since your purpose is for the wool, you transgress the prohibition of gozez. On the other end over here, what you want is not the wool, but the skin. You want the skin to be smooth. So since you want the skin to be smooth, that's your objective. That puts you under the category of mochek. Now says the Ramam, and we'll, remi- we'll remind ourselves what we learned in the beginning of the laws of tefillin, that once you process a hide of an animal, as is, it's called gvil. It's a pretty thick piece. And uh, you could use it right away to write a Torah scroll, for example. It could be used as parchment. But many people would divide widthwise that piece of skin. And they would have two parts. One is called klaf, one is called duchsustus. We're going to go with the standard text of the Ramam, where klaf is the outer half of the animal hide, and duchsustus is the inner half of the animal hide. Other texts have it reversed, but we're going to go with a simple understanding. Says the Rambam, hamefarek duchsustus me'ala klaf. One who separates the inner half from the outer half of the hide. Hareze toledet mafshit v'chayav. That's a derivative of skinning, because you're taking apart the skin, and you're held liable. There's another couple of words here in the text. It doesn't really belong here in this area of skinning. It belongs later or earlier, depending on which commentaries you follow. Somebody who steps on a hide with his feet till it hardens. Or you soften it by hand, by pulling it, by leveling it. This is a guy pulling hides in different directions. As the shoemakers do. That's a derivative of working tanning the skins, and you'd be liable. One who picks feathers from the wing of a bird. Interestingly, it's a derivative of, of smoothing the skin. Because the reason why you typically pick feathers is so that you're left with the smooth skin of the bird. 
The same would hold true for somebody who smooths out a compress or a bandage, or he levels wax or tar. Anything similar from those things which could be flattened, till he creates a smooth surface, you're held liable on account of the malacha of smoothing. Similarly, if you have a piece of skin that is hanging between poles, as they used to do, they would hang hides on a frame to stretch it, and you go with your hands and you're rubbing down the skin, you are held liable on account of the malacha of smoothing. And that's all we have for the malacha of smoothing. Now we move on to the next malacha, the cutting of the skin down to size. If you cut out from a piece of hide enough parchment, enough skin, to write on it an amulet, chayav, you are held liable. But you have to know how much length you're producing, how much width you're producing, and cut with intention. For that, what's what makes it a labor. But if you're simply cutting destructively, or without intent for the measurement, rather casually, or as one who's playing a game, you are exempt. Because it's rabbinically forbidden, but it's not malechet machashevet. There is no thought, and it's not constructive. Hakotemet hakanaf. I think I have a picture of this. One who, one who trims down a wing. They would separate the down from the feathers to create a down filling for a pillow, whatever it is. You want the down. That's a derivative of cutting, and you're liable. Somebody who planes off the edges of cedar beams. I have over here. Somewhat of a video, you can see a guy takes a plane. If it's playing over here, yep. Takes the plane and produces this tiny little thin layer of, uh, yeah, you can see right over there, he's putting it down, from the edge of a cedar beam. That's Megared, Rashe Klona Sochal Erez. Chayav Mishum Mechatech, you are held liable on account of cutting. Any uh, size, any um, to size cut that a um, woodworker will cut from wood, or a smithy, uh, person that works with metal, will cut from metal, we will have you liable as one who cuts. A person who takes a small twig from right in front of him, a small little wood chip, and he cuts it, you know, breaks it down to use as a toothpick or to open a door, you're also held liable on account of mechatech. Anything which is fitting to be eaten by an animal. Like straw or like wet grass or like a palm branches and anything like it. You can cut them on Shabbos. Because there is no such thing as fixing a vessel here. You simply could be say you could be just using it for animal uh, for animal fodder. You can also cut off myrtle branches or good smelling branches to smell them, even though they're hard and they're dry, it's not considered to be cutting. You can uproot, you can pluck whatever you want. Whether you strip it off a big tree or off of a small tree. In the Shulchan Aruch, when they quote this law, they add it has to be done for a sick person. However, the later authorities say even for healthy people. It's not, it's, it's, there's, no, there's no malacha here, technically, um, of breaking uh, fr- fragrant branches. Uh, if, if I didn't, sound like it before, obviously we cannot pluck it out of the ground. That would be certainly a malacha. You have a ready-made myrtle and you want to crack it to get more of the smell out. That's okay. Halacha tet, we move to the next malacha of ktiva, of writing. Hakotev shte otiyot chayav. One who writes two letters is already liable for writing. Hamochek ktav, and the next malacha is the mechika, the erasing. Hamochek ktav, al menat lichtov b'mekom ha-machak, shte otiyot chayav. If you erase writing in order to write in the place of the erasure two letters, then chayav, you're also held liable for erasing. Let's talk a couple of laws about writing. Hakotev ot achat gedola kishtayim. If you write one letter that's as big as two normal ones, patur, you are exempt. Rabbinically forbidden, biblically we can't hold you liable. Machak ot achat gedola, v'yesh bim koma kedil lichtov shtayim. The inverse would also be true for erasing. If you erase the massive letter which has the space to write two letters in its place, chayav, you'd be liable. Katav ot achat v'yishlim ba'at sefer. If you wrote only one letter, but it was a very important letter, it was the finishing letter, the final letter of a book, chayav, you're held liable. Like that by weaving, you know, when you weave the last thread, that already constitutes weaving. Over here also, writing the last letter is an important type of writing. Hakotev al menat le or now when somebody writes, simply to destroy the parchment, here counterintuitively chayav, you're liable. Even though typically the guiding principle in Lchot Shabbat is that if I do something destructive, I am exempt. 
Here says the Rambam, when it comes to writing, you'd be liable. Because the obligation that one incurs, the liability that you incur for writing on Shabbos isn't because of the space that's being occupied now with letters, but for the writing itself. So even though your writing was with a destructive purpose relative to the parchment, the parchment is getting destroyed, but the writing has been done. And the writing was done purposefully. So you're liable. But if you erase for a destructive purpose, patur, then you're indeed exempt. If ink fell onto a book and you erased it, so it wasn't any letters, just erased ink. Or some wax fell onto your ledger, to your notebook, and you erased it. If in its place there's room to write two letters, so since you've cleared enough space to write two letters, even though what you erased wasn't letters, chayav, you're liable. Interesting, when it comes to the writing, the, the, the chiyuv is for the writing itself. When it comes to the erasing, the erasing is to create the place for two letters. If a person writes one letter twice, and it comes out to be the name of somebody or something. And there are a couple of examples that Ramam gives. Dad, which could mean a handle, or a breast. Tet, to give. Gag, a roof. Rar, drooling. Shesh, six, or linen. Sas, rejoicing. Chach, is a bracelet. These all have meanings. Chayav, you're liable. On the other hand, if you would write two letters that don't have a meaning, the commentaries say you're not liable. And a person who writes in any language or in any script, in other words, not just if you write in a different script Hebrew words or another language, you know, Hebrew letters, even if it's a foreign language, foreign script, chayav, you're liable. Even if they are two simply signs. Uh, the commentaries say the signs have to have some kind of meaning. So, uh, for example, the Magid Mishnah gives the example in the Torah scroll, we have sometimes a backwards nun. It isn't a letter, but it has a meaning. So if you write two of those, you'd be liable. If you write one letter next to a pre-existing letter, or you superimpose writing on top of writing, or if a person intends to write a chet, but instead he writes two zayins. You see over here that in the way we write Torah scrolls, the chet is actually two zayins attached by a roof. So let's say you wanted to write a chet, but in the end you just wrote the two zayins without the connecting roof. Or anything like that in other letters that would, that would apply. Or if you write one letter on the ground and one letter on the roof, where they cannot be read with each other, they're just, they stand independently. Or you wrote two letters on two opposite sides of a ledger and they cannot be read one with the other. Patur, you are exempt. But if you were to write two letters on two attached walls that meet at a corner, or on two pages of a notebook, and they're two opposite pages, they're not, two, not double-sided, they're on two separate sides, and therefore they can be read one with the other, you'd be liable on account of writing. If you took parchment, unprocessed parchment, as is, or something like that, and you wrote one letter on it in this country or in this city, and then you walked on Shabbos to a permitted, a permitted walk, and on a different scroll, a different place, you wrote a separate letter. Chayav, you are now liable. The two letters combine. Because if you were to bring them together, the two pieces of parchment, they could be read one with the other. Nothing is lacking in bringing them together. So, therefore, you become liable on account of the fact that you wrote two separate letters. Let's say you write one letter. But this one letter has a meaning, because it's an acronym, it's an abbreviation for something. Even if we could read out of it, you can deduce from it an entire word. Patur, you are still exempt because you only wrote one letter. Ketzah, what's an example of this? Let's say he wrote a mem on a box of produce. And everybody reads that as ma'aser. We have many times that when a person has crop, he has to give a couple of gifts. Truma to the Kohen, the first round of Maeser to the Levi. Then he takes Maaser Sheni, a second set of tithes, and brings it to Jerusalem and eats it in a certain state of holiness. So since it had to be a certain level of holiness, people would mark their boxes, they would write a mem, and that stood for Maaser. So if you write this mem on Shabbat, everybody reads it as a full word. Or let's say you wrote a mem in the place of a number. Every Hebrew letter has a numerical value. Mem equals 40. Let's say you had 40 eggs in a box, and you put a mem to mark there's 40 eggs in this box. The mem is now read as arba'im, a full word, 40. It's as though you wrote the word arba'im. Nevertheless, you're exempt. 
If you were editing one letter and by editing it, you made it into two. Same slide here. You were looking at a chet, you erased the roof, and by erasing the roof, you made it into two letters. Chayad, you're now liable, even though you didn't write the actual letters. And the same would apply to all similar situations. One who writes with his left hand, not his strong hand, or with the back of his hand, with his foot, with his mouth, or with, under, with his elbow. Here we have a picture of a very famous man who wrote simultaneously with his foot, his two hands, and his mouth. Um, nevertheless, it isn't the normal way of writing. Patur, you're exempt. If a lefty wrote with his right hand, which was equivalent to the left hand of everybody else, his weaker hand, Patur is also exempt. Game katab bismolov wrote with his strong hand, which is the left hand. Chayav he is liable. The hasholet b'shtei adav a person who is ambidextrous and rules both hands equally. The katab ben bimino ben bismolov and writes whether with his right or with his left hand. Chayav he is liable. Katan oches ba kulmos v'gadol oches biadov v'kotev. If you have a child holding on to a pen and the adult is holding on to the child and he's helping him write, chayav the adult is, is liable. Gadol oches ba kulmos v'katan oches biadov v'kotev. But if the adult is holding the pen and the child is guiding the adult's hand from the outside. And writing, patur, the adult is exempt because he didn't do any of the actual writing actively. In order to be liable for writing, you have to write with something which marks and leaves a mark permanently. Kigon, for example, the Ramam gives an example of a couple of permanent inks. Kigon, dio, like regular ink, shchor, black tint, sikra, vermilion, it's a red type of a thing. Vikumos and gum, the kantantum and vitriol. These are all on the screen over here. The chayotze baham and anything like them. The yichtov, and you also have to write, not just with a permanent ink, but on. Al davar shemitkayem aktav alav. On something which the writing will last on. You can go on, for example, or uklaf, skin, parchment, or niyar ve'etz, paper or wood, the chayotze baham and anything like it. Avala koteb bedavar she'en yishuma omet. But if somebody were to write with a material which won't last, like liquid and juice, or you write with ink, on some leaves, or on something on which it won't last, patur, you're exempt. You're only liable until you write with something which lasts, on something which lasts. And the same applies with erasing. You're only obligated for erasing. You have to erase permanent writing from something on which it would have lasted otherwise. Somebody who writes on his skin. Simply, not a tattoo, just writing onto his skin. You're liable, or it's a type of skin, and it's liable. Even though later on the heat of your body is going to let this, is going to take the skin and have it evaporate off of your, take the writing and have it evaporate off of your skin. At that point, it will be considered like writing which got erased. But right now, it's writing that lasts. But somebody who etches into his skin the form of a letter of writing, paturi is exempt because that isn't the normal way of writing. One who rips, tears out from a piece of uh, parchment the shape of letters. So that's the blue paper on top. He literally cut out all these Hebrew letters. Chayav mishum kotev. You're liable. That's considered writing. Haroshem al haor ketavnit ketav. One who marks on paper the outline of writing, as they do many times for, you know, towards the end of a Sefer Torah, they leave the last couple letters only outlined and the people can fill it in to honor them with filling in the letters. The person who made the outline is patur. He's exempt. One who puts black ink on top of red ink, Chayav is obligated on two accounts. One for writing, one for erasing. He wrote the black and he erased the red. But if you put black on black, red on red, or red on black, patur, then you are exempt. It's a different level. You can consider it to be writing and erasing. One who draws. That's a derivative of writing. What would that look like? Somebody who makes designs with blue paint or with red paint, uh, anything like it which the artists typically do. Yeah, here you have a nice little mural, person drew on a wall. Some, some people even have in the halacha, instead of bakochal, bakotel, on a wall. Anyway, you drew some pictures, like artists like to draw. You're liable on account of writing. Somebody who also erases something which was marked 
and he erases it with the intent of fixing it, either to fix that picture or to draw another one. It's a derivative of mochek, and you are liable. And the Ramam concludes with examining the final, uh, another melecha, the 28th, Hamesartet, a person who rules lines. To write two letters at least under the lining. Chayav, you are liable on account of Mesartet of Sirtut. Woodworkers who draw a red line, Agabea Kora on a beam, Kadesha Yin Sorbe so it should cut equally. That's a derivative of Mesartet. Here you have a person on wood marking with a ruler where he's going to cut. And also cement mixers show us in Ken Ba'avanim, who do so with stones. They can cut, they can hew the stone properly. They mark, that's somebody marking on a stone right there. That's also considered to be liable for Mesartet. Whether you rule the lines with something that leaves a color or not, like in the Torah scroll, you see over here, we just make lines with a stylus, there is no color. Whether you do it with color or with no color, you will be held liable for the melacha of Mesartet.